up. So let's just okay. go ahead and start. So, uh, friends, uh, good evening and uh, good morning to those who are joining, maybe from the US, different parts of the US. Uh, today, we are at uh, session eight of the master class in audio. And uh, we have with us a real master in the true sense, I would call a sensei, uh, someone who uh, has probably spent more than 40 years or four decades in the industry. If I'm, yeah. Is that right, Norman? Yeah, that is true. <laughs> you don't look a you don't look a rage. You don't look a rage at all. That's, yeah, uh, I don't feel it either. That's all. Yeah, that's also a testament to your uh, the, the the fitness levels that you keep uh, yourself. I believe you're a very active outdoorsy outdoorsy person. Yes. yes. Wonderful. So uh, it's my duty to just uh, give a brief introduction to Norman. A lot of people who are uh, audiophiles in uh, particularly who do uh, two channel audio would know Norman from his. Uh, uh, experience working in different country uh, companies. He has uh, he's worked in kinetics, uh, noise control. He's worked in Owen Corning Science and Technology Center, and also at MIT uh, University in Boston. Uh, he currently owns a, a, a company called AV Room Service, uh, which besides uh, uh, consult. If I'm not mistaken, uh, Norman, you also consult extensively. If, if that's right. Yeah, that is correct. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, apart from extensive consultancy in the audio uh, segment, uh, audio industry, Norman also has some uh, products which are which are used extensively uh, for uh, various applications, be it uh, stereo or be it uh, home theaters. Essentially, what are known as equipment uh, equipment vibration protectors. If that I can use that word, is that the right uh, terminology? For that? Yes, EVP equipment vibration protectors. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yes. that's one of our. Um, biggest selling products, kind of our, our bread and butter right now. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, that's, uh, and no, so Norman has been very active. He's also, he's also integrated or rather installed, uh, I, I don't know how many systems probably across the world. So I don't want to even uh, take a guesstimate. I would uh, request Norman to just give a figure to that uh, <laughs> particular thing. How many installations he has probably done in his 40 uh, year career or 40 yeah, plus years. It's, uh... Uh, hundreds anyway, probably, um, I, you know, I, I have a hard time guessing too, but um, I know a while back it was over 400. So wow. maybe it's uh, closer to 500 now. I don't know. And these would be, these would be, uh, these would be uh, deployments across the world, I believe, right? Uh, or predominantly in Europe and US or how does uh, it Definitely all over the world. Um but yes, I'd say, you know, predominantly in the United States. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I specialize in um, small room acoustics, you know, which is a, a different discipline than, than uh, performance or, or large spaces. So, you know, more specifically, like you said, two channel, home theater, uh, recording yes. studios. Yes. Yeah. What I call uh, critical listening spaces. Yes. Yes. So uh, I would say that without further ado, I'll pass on the, uh, the stage, the honors to uh, Norman. Uh, Norman, uh, okay. the floor is yours. Uh, uh, yeah, you can maybe share your presentation and uh, let's, let's just take it on from there. Sounds good. Okay. Okay, um, and from the beginning. Uh, just, just one moment, Norman. I'll just make an announcement. So uh, I request everyone to keep their uh, audio muted, uh, which I think it is at the moment. So only Norman uh, will be having his audio uh, unmuted for the time being. Uh, I'm also going to mute my audio. And uh, I would request everyone to please, uh, let's say, uh, turn off your videos also, which is also uh, the way it is right now. Uh, request you to please uh, post your questions as they come. Don't uh, wait till the end to keep all your questions. You, you may uh, post your questions on the chat box. The chat window is uh, being monitored by me actively. So as and when I feel the question which is relevant is being asked, uh, I will uh, choose to either uh, flag it towards the end or I will post it to uh, Norman right away. Thank you. Over to you, Norman. All right. Sounds good. So as you can see, the, the title of this presentation is Noise and Vibration from an Audiophile's Perspective. 
And that could be a, um, a home theater enthusiast. Um, it could certainly apply to a recording studio, you know, control room and, and so forth. But um, the audio files perspective, I've been using this at some of the trade shows that are specifically for audio files. So, you know, two channel or maybe immersive sound. Again, small room acoustics is the uh, is the the discipline here. Um, so what we're going to cover in this presentation is um, is fun what I call fundamentals and basics as far as uh, acoustics and and in a second segment we'll talk about um, electrical fundamentals as well meaning uh, AC. Um, so we're going to talk about what the fundamental sound quality attribute attributes are for a critical listening in space like I described. Um, we're going to cover how far off the typical listening environment is from the desired. And we're going to talk about what these attributes mean to the experience. In other words, you know, emotionally, psychoacoustically, um, joy. <laughs> we're going to um, uh, talk about how these sound quality characteristics are measured and as well as a solution to these common problems. <laughs> uh, so these are fundamentals and with those there is a, a hierarchy. In other words, you, you need to handle um, this before you. it makes sense to handle that and we'll talk about that. So uh, there are specifications that we are commonly looking at and um, a lot of these specifications are, are meaningless, and some of them are very meaningful. Um, for example, if you're looking at um, getting some new equipment, you might be looking at total harmonic distortion, and uh, you might be looking at um, uh, frequency response graphs of speakers. Um, these things are certainly important, but uh, relatively, unimportant compared to more meaningful things that we should be looking at. Total harmonic distortion nowadays is, you know, we're often talking 0, 0.00 something. It's, you know, it's it's way down there. Um, we're not going to be able to hear it. And probably it's, it's a meaningless specification to us. Um, frequency response for, for speakers, it's fine, but uh, it does not tell us how it sounds. We can find many speakers that might have the same curve, the, the same um, response, but they sound radically different. So um, anyway, just a, a few examples of, of, um, of, you know, kind of, we seem to pay attention to them, but they're really kind of meaningless. More important would be, for example, do you know what the, ambient noise floor is in in your listening space in other words the when the equipment is on and if it's a home theater that means the projector's on the hvac is on all the equipment is on what is the ambient noise floor what is you know when you're not playing any signal there's noise and how low is that that's an important one to know because that's going to control dynamic range and low level details and and so forth do you know what your reverberation times are in the room? Again, critical to um, to the sound quality attributes. Um, and, and most people have no idea. Um, and they're all different. Every room is unique and we want to avoid that. We want to make it neutral. Um, do you know what your ground impedance is? And we'll go into this further in, in the, the second segment. So this is this is my big bold statement. I would say that more than 90% of the audio files are experiencing less than 50% of their equipment's potential. So in other words, they've got maybe a very high-end system, uh, you know, expensive, a large investment, but it's put in an environment that is not conducive to the potential the equipment is capable of. And so that investment and that potential and that loss of uh, potential and, and experience is, is never experienced because the, con the environment, the condition of the environment and the setup is, uh, is controlling that. And uh, so 
why is this? Uh, there's quite a few answers to that. One, I believe there are um, several reasons. One may be that they are inexperienced as to the potential. Most of us, our reference is the best system that we've ever heard. Whatever that may be, we're all different as far as what we've been exposed to. So my reference might be different than yours. And, and um, um, so until you've experienced something better, you don't know. So this is definitely uh, um, one of the reasons. Um, they may not be aware of the obstacles that are preventing a better experience, and that's what this presentation is going to be covering. They may not know how to control those obstacles, and again, we're going to cover that. There may be constraints preventing them from achieving their goal, and every room is a compromise. There's no such thing as a perfect room. There's always going to be things in the way. They, those constraints might be physical. They might be decor, they might be budget, they might be um, uh, time. There's, there's many, many things that could be limiting as far as what we can do. Um, and another one is that they're told the answer is to buy better equipment and, and, and not the case. <laughs> you can't, uh, if the environment is right here, well, Better equipment can never overcome that environment. So you can have a, uh, a state-of-the-art system in a mediocre environment, and it can only sound, it can only perform mediocre. You could have a mid-fi equipment set up properly in a great environment, and it will beat the socks off of the high-end equipment in the mediocre environment every single time. Norman, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh... What you just now said is probably something that you need to probably repeat a uh, hundred times uh, to to the industry because it's it's such an important statement that you make about uh, the fact that uh, the equipment is only as good as the room or the the space in which it, it is uh, installed or it is set up. So that's a, yes. a, a a very very profound statement that you make and something that uh, a lot of our folks in the industry uh, probably. Uh, don't subscribe to that uh, that particular uh, thought, but yeah, I, I think over the uh, over the course of your presentation, I think there will be an epiphany for many people <laughs> in that sense. Please go ahead, Mom. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. No problem. It is. I mean, this is something that I deal with, of course, <laughs> all the time. Um, and uh, in our world, I you know, acoustics. We're talking right now about acoustics. It's not something that's tangible. It's not something that's sexy to look at. Um, it's, um, it's invisible, but it controls the performance and it controls our experience and our joy. There is, a, and, and this is not part of the presentation, but I'm going to, to bring it up. So when I was at uh, Owens Coring uh, Science and Technology Center, I, I built two identical rooms, and these rooms were um, were built very well, so that room mode distribution was good, and and so forth. They were also built identical, and they were set up identical. I I, I did it. I mean, these were laser aimed. Um, they were very precise. But one room had um, at the time Owens Corning's acoustic um, uh, panels in it, and the other one did not. This is why they hired me was to, to engineer this product. And um, I noticed when I had, there were times where we would have uh, somebody visiting, some you know VIP visiting, and we would have to discuss uh, our, our research with them. And, and so you do a little demonstration. And, and so we had this typical room, um, you know, rather untreated. It, it was like a, a normal room with a sofa and, and a bookcase and a and couple of tables, and, and it was a home theater, okay? And then the other one had exactly the same equipment, calibrated precisely the same, only it had Owens Corning's acoustic room system in it. Um, as I would do this demonstration, these VIPs, they're... <laughs> They are not audio fanatics. Um, and yet I noticed that they would say in the treated room, oh, wow, I, I want this at home. And so after a few of those experiences, I realized that it's not just me 
who understands it and who appreciates audio and loves audio, it's anybody. And so um, at the Science and Te Technology uh, Center, we had we had about uh, at the time we had about 400 engineers there, and we had our own uh, medical facility there and our own audiology lab, um, you know, booth and everything. And everyone had to have um, a physical checkup there at the lab once a year, including um, audiology. And uh, so I decided let's do. Um, uh, an, an, a biofeedback analysis. And so I, I got people who fit a, a good hearing window that, you know, that, um, that met my criteria and asked for volunteers. And I got a, a, about, I think I got a couple of dozen and um, we did, we played a, um, a seven minute clip of Das Boat. And it's a pretty intense little scene we would do biofeedback. In other words, we're measuring heart rate, respiratory, sweat, um, and, and so forth. And we would play uh, that we would have them cool down, measure them, play them in the uh, in one room, um, measure them, cool down, and then do the same in the other room. And sometimes they went in the A room, sometimes in the B room first, it didn't matter. With the exception of one individual who I think must have been um, uh, he he was just flat line the whole time. Um, I think he was thinking of uh, something must have been on his mind because he was just like unresponsive, no change. Everyone else though, their blood pressure, their heart rate, their respiration all went up in the acoustically treated room. Now, it looks the same. They don't understand it. And yet acoustics controlled their emotion. They had a much more engaging experience in the treated room. So um, that to me, it was one of my, uh, in, in my career, that was one of my highlights is, is kind of uh, that proof that acoustics can control your emotion. So back to the presentation. So what are audiophiles doing in the meantime? We were talking about how, you know, they're often misled into, well, you've got to get, you know, a new piece of gear so that it performs better. And yet remember their environment is limiting them. Uh, so on the left-hand side, we've got typical action taken to improve the audio experience. Well, most people get new upgrades or they do tweaks. Um, and uh, as far as airborne interior acoustic treatments, you know, panels and, getting first order reflections and reverberation times and stuff under the control or, or physical setup, you know, aiming the speakers and, and um, uh, positioning the, um, the, the speakers and the listener properly within the room, a little less so. Structure born, talking about, you know, mechanical isolation, uh, vibration control and damping, uh, even less so. Versus on the right-hand side, this is, what those things will impact on the experience. And so you can see that the graphs, the columns, they're very different. They're almost opposite. Um, so that's kind of the, the science versus um, the typical mentality that, uh, that we're having to deal with. And so that is a tough hill to climb. Um, you know, it's, it's not easy to, uh, to just say, hey, all you got to do is get this new preamp or this new interconnect and, and you'll reach audio nirvana. Not the case. Um, it's, it's, um, it, it may be cheaper than that though. That's also something to think about. A lot of these things are, um, are free. So this is kind of a graph showing, you know, that philosophy. What's most important is setup and calibration and acoustics. That's going to weigh a lot more of uh, the experience over electronics will. I'm not saying both are not important. They are. I'm just saying that you have to have you have to have these fundamentals in place before this makes any sense. Before it it can uh, perform as it as its potential. So let's talk about who the audiophile is. Because specifically, I'm talking about the um, those who are are really you know, wanting to get the most out of the recording. So it is a person desiring to reproduce 
the artist's musical work accurately through an audio playback system in a small room. What defines a small room? In our audiophile scenario, this could be a home theater, it could be a recording studio, it's a space that meets the following criteria. We'll likely apply sound source frequencies whose wavelengths are longer than the longest dimension of the space incorporate shorter decay rates than performance spaces, has strong early reflections compared to the direct sound. In addition, our typical audiophile room includes the following acoustical characteristics. Decay rates that vary uniquely and wildly by frequency. I'm gonna, we're gonna talk about this. Every room has, uh, a, that is not controlled, um, has reverberation times that are as unique as our voice or thumbprint or or whatever. We don't want that. We want to we want to have uh, um, neutrality and 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 have it under control so that it's repeatable and consistent. They will also have unique room modes, which is going to be dictated on the dimensions and the construction and uh, materials of the the room. Um, and a rather high ambient noise floor, like we discussed, and um, and just a, your typical standard electrical service, which is limiting, and, and we'll discuss that further in a, another segment. So ideally, the goal is a neutral environment. We don't want to add or subtract from the recording. We don't want to hear, um, let's say we're playing an orchestral um, piece that was recorded at a, um, at a particular venue, and we want to hear that venue. You know, that's part of the 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 performance is the reverberation of that venue. We don't want to hear that venue's reverberation and then ours too interfering with it. Uh, we also do not want to we one that does not introduce unwanted vibrations. And so, what are unwanted vibrations? Well, they're a number of unwanted vibrations and, and understand that all we want to hear is the direct airborne sound waves from the, the loudspeakers to our ears. Now, in, in, um, in smaller detail, we do want to hear a little bit of our room and we'll discuss that, but um, not much and we want it to be controlled. So these other unwanted vibrations may include reflections they may be appliances and footballs, electrical noise, plumbing, outside noises, resonances, buzzes and rattles of the structure. Um, vibrations could also cause mechanical and electrical interference. So we want a neutral environment. That's our goal. This foundation is our reference for making um, our, our value judgments. So you can imagine if it is skewed, then so are our judgments. Um, oops, and if it is skewed, so is our experience. So here is a a typical, well, I've got two columns here. We've got an average listening room, which is what our you know end user is typically dealing with. And then over on the right hand side, we have our goal, our our desired um, uh, goal, our desired target. So ambient noise floor, we talked about, you know, what is the, with everything turned on, how low is the noise floor in, in our room? Well, the typical uh, environment is about 40 decibels sound pressure level, um, A weighted, and we would like to get down to 18. That's a significant, as you can imagine, that's a significant difference in dynamic range and also then therefore low level detail. And we'll come to a graph where it, it explains that, um, but that's a, that's a big, big jump, but it is doable. Dynamic range, we're, we're typically dealing with about 62 or rather 60 dB, and we should be able to obtain 82 dB without, much, uh, without too much difficulty. Reverberation times, as I said, and as I will show, uh, every room is just, the curve is just very unique and um, and typically varies by more than a second. You you when we talk about reverberation times, notice that I talk about it plurally. So um, often in acoustics, we're talking about 
using a, a, a single number to define something that really is a, a curve that we should be looking at. So with reverberation times, we want to look at time over frequency, you know, from whatever, from 20 hertz to 20K. And so those reverberation times can vary wildly. And, uh, and we don't want that. We want to have them vary less than 0.4 seconds across the, the frequency range. <clears throat> Room modes. This is another one you probably have experienced. They're always a problem. And they'll swing plus or minus 12 dB. So in other words, a, a, a 25 dB difference. And we would like to get them controlled under plus or minus about 5 dB. Um, if you walk in into, like, say, a, a corner of, of a, a room, you're going to hear all those room modes, and, and the bass gets very muddy. Um, if we put our loudspeakers there, or if we put a, a person there, they're not going to get a very linear uh, frequency response. Well, room modes, um, they vary throughout the room, and, and, um, and that's a whole other topic, but they are difficult to control. Um, um, there are many ways though that they can be controlled, but they are a, a problem that, that we all have to deal with. And, um, bass response is probably for the average Joe, the average listener. Um, one of the key attributes as far as sound quality is how good does the bass sound? So, and then vibration isolation, most people aren't dealing with it at all. And, uh, and we would like to mitigate a good 90% of that. And we'll talk about that a little bit uh, further as well. So what can we expect under these conditions? So let's talk about the noise floor. As we said, it's gonna limit our dynamic range. Um, low level details are gonna be masked. They're gonna be covered up by the ambient noise. We can't hear them. We can't enjoy them. We miss that dynamic range um, and poor level low level detail and also distractions we've probably all experienced where we're um, maybe watching a, a, a movie and suddenly the HVAC stops and we go ah oh. <laughs> you know big uh, or maybe it starts uh, and it's a, a real distraction or maybe we're watching some movie that is taking place under sea and we hear an airplane pass by from outside <laughs> um, things like that are are um are a distraction and they pull you back out of the, the movie experience. Reverberation times, again, limited dynamic range, masking of low level details, poor intelligibility. We're gonna talk about that in a little bit too. And tonal and spatial interference. So reverberation times, remember there's going to be a curve as far as um, frequency over time. So they are tonal, some rooms sound you may, you may typically talk about them as being either live or dead, but more specifically, it can be bright or, or dark or, or muddy, or you, know, you can start putting color descriptions on rooms as well, because certain frequencies are dominating other frequencies. So just like an equalizer, only we're talking about time smearing or, or ringing or decay lingering. Um, and then spatial interference. When, when the room is very reverberant, then we're going to lose that three-dimensional holographic imaging. We're, we're, we might even lose um, uh, imaging as, as far as uh, uh, not only spatial cues, but, but timbre and, and get confused as to even what that instrument might be. Room modes, nonlinear bass response in articulation. There's a test, and that graph right there that I'm showing is a, a before and after test of a what's called the music articulation test tone, and it's a, a, a gated sweep from uh, 20 to I think it's 500 hertz, um, and it sounds kind of like this. It's a sixteenth of a second on and a sixteenth of a second off, and it goes do 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 do, and then. Um, that's the way it's supposed to sound, very articulate. But in a typical room where you've got room modes interfering with one another, it, it'll slur. It'll sound like, like the red graph down here will sound like. Doo, 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 doo. So um, 
getting rim modes under control is a big one as far as base um, response goes and and uh, articulation and uh, and punch and and linearity and and all of that um, and has a big influence on on um, on tonality and then mechanical isolation you know this can be anything from you know the actual shell what I call you know the 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 construction of the room, the um, the shell of the room from resonating, everything resonates. Uh, it might even buzz and rattle. It could even cause tracking errors on turntables or or laser players. Um, anything with the digital clock with the quartz crystal in it. Um, and again, it 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 actually affects all the what I call the um, the sound quality attributes. It'll touch upon all of those which is unique compared to these others, you know, that are more specific to different ranges or, or qualities. Um, mechanical isolation will mess up everything. Um, so tonal and, and spatial, et cetera. Hmm. So under such conditions, can we expect to hear subtle equipment changes? Probably not. Can we expect to make fair assessments? Probably not. Might we be compensating for system anomalies? If you've got um, uh, a room that's a, a bit bright uh, or, or um, a room mode problem, um, might you be uh, trying to find equipment and or cables that compensates for that? And is that the right way to go? Um, no, I don't think so, because then you'll, you'll constantly be changing, uh, chasing your tail and be confused. I believe that we want to get the fundamental corrected. Um, and usually this is this is done passively. Um, but yeah, we want to have a uh, we want to start with as neutral uh, conditions as we can so that we aren't influenced by the room. Um, uh, no, I'm just going to uh, interrupt you again at this point in time. Uh, once again, that, that statement that you made right now about uh, the passive techniques of uh, uh, compensation, I think that's a very, very important point that you make. And uh, the entire world is probably, uh, let's say, uh, so uh, so much focus and so much, uh, let's say, uh, heavily biased towards electronic and active means of uh, compensation. That is, we fail to realize that uh, unless the passive mode of compensation is uh, probably, uh, the, the foundation is strong enough, uh, everything else is just a, uh, going to be a uh, maybe it's not going to it's going to depend on that that's the foundation of your uh, the entire room the, uh, the the acoustics or the the room treatment that you do is going to be the foundation yeah. of how your audio is going to sound over to you, right. you. yes uh, good point um the world is uh you know room correction is is something that you know um i i fight with a, a, a bit I, I don't have anything against DSP. Um, it can it it can and and needs to be and should be incorporated often. But DSP people seem to think it's kind of a it'll address everything and it won't. It can't control reverberation times. It can't stop buzzes and rattles or resonances. On and on. There's only so much it can do, and it usually has a sound quality to it you know everybody's room correction uses their own algorithm and and it's you know you can identify it it has a, a signature to it what i'm suggesting uh is that when possible to um to address things at the source um which would mean with acoustics passively with dsp you're controlling the signal that goes to the loudspeaker and then the signal that comes from the loudspeaker into the air, it can't control. Um, it can only make compensations to try and, and, and uh, uh, make adjustments for it. Anyway, like I say, uh, DSP is, um, is important and it has its place, but I believe it's, it's, it, it should be the, uh, hard for me to say, but the, the last thing that we should be looking at, we should be trying to address the problem at the source, which means we're we're addressing it passively. We're not going to deal with it electronically. And for those 
again, audio files that are, are you know, analog, um, really into analog. They don't want to introduce any digital uh, to their systems anyway. Um, so anyway. I think you. I think you can keep. Uh, you can repeat this. This this particular statement probably a hundred times at the cost of uh, repetition because this is such a such an important statement that you made, Norman. And I think. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, it uh, over back to you. All right. Okay. Um, yeah, we talked about that. Okay. This is a very busy uh, <laughs> graphic here. There's on. Um, on my website, there's a YouTube, and and uh, and I've actually got audio to go with this. And and what I what I did is um, just taking octaves, you know, from lowest to highest, and boosting it 12 dB or subtracting it 12 dB. And so then, you know, this is um, this is kind of our the way we talk. And and another thing that I'm trying to advocate is that we all try and and use the same descriptors so that we're on the same page and and oh my gosh that won't happen in my lifetime but um but it is important to try and 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 use the same verbiage have the same descriptors so that we can communicate with one another and and really know what we're we're talking about but you've probably seen and and used these types of descriptions yourself and this is a, a graph that's just kind of fun to 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 look at, but also uh, to to listen to. Um, and so again, it, it I use the the reverberation. Heck, you can you can have rooms that qualify for you know any of these descriptors. It's not just you know how the how a, an EQ was uh, was used on the recording or or whatever. So uh, acoustical objectives, we want to make the room sonically disappear in the playback system. We don't want to hear it. We want to control the influence of structure-borne and airborne sound vibrations. So these problems in small rooms are, you know, in a contain small contained environment is the sound waves propagate throughout the space at the mercy of the size, the shape, the construction, the materials and the methods, the furnishings, etc. Every object will resonate, reflect, absorb, and transmit energy. Most of the energy is returned back into the listening space. This is something that people don't realize either. In a typical environment, one that's not controlled acoustically, most of the sound energy or, or intensity that you hear <clears throat> percentage-wise is coming from the room, not from the, the loudspeakers. Um, you can you can uh, be closer to the loudspeakers and mask more of the room, and, and that can be very helpful. But in the typical environment, most of the sound you hear is returned energy, and, and that's uh, um, uh, not something that we want. We want to we want to hear just the recording. So, the solutions there are newer methods of acoustic measurements, modeling, and treatments that are available to offer. A, uh, a means of controlling sound waves in an organized, controlled fashion that is predictable. With acoustics, when we're talking about, um, let's say we're uh, we're not talking about construction, uh, but just acoustic panels. Uh, there are many types of acoustic panels, not just absorption. There's reflection, there's diffusion, and so forth. And they're going to there are panels that address different frequencies. And you need to understand that you don't just haphazardly put them up. You need to understand what type of uh, of um, panel is doing what, so that you can put the right panel type at the right location where it's going to work correctly in the right quantity, so that you don't overdo it or underdo it. Again, every room's unique. The results are an elevated and superior audio experience that better represents the artist's intent. And also, I might add, better represents the potential of the equipment and the, the designer and manufacturer's intentions. This is also a, a, a busy um, uh, graphic. And um, I pay less attention to the perforated uh, red rectangle those are more those are pretty expensive to deal with 
as you look in the columns, you'll see on the, the left, acoustic, this is the acoustic control column in the middle of the uh, control measures and the control benefit. Let's look below the perforated box at speaker listener positions and speaker toe-in, first order reflections, reverberation times, loud speech, speaker structural vibration transfer. Now, those things are well, the first the first couple are free. They don't cost the, um, the end user anything, but some time and some patience maybe. And uh, um, the, the control measures of those are, are going to be the speaker and listener room locations within that room. It's gonna have an optimum location. The toe-in is uh, you know, the, the, uh, the angles towards the, the listener. And that can be a little bit subjective. Um, but that's going to control sound stage and, and timbre. First order reflections, you deal with uh, absorption and diffusion, and they, were they will control spatiality and timbre. Uh, reverberation times, you're going to deal with absorption. They're going to control resolution and dynamics. Loudspeaker structural vibration transfer, that uh, is going to be mean using mechanical isolation. And as I say, that the control benefit is going to be articulation, sound stage, resolution, dynamics, spatiality, and timbre. Not to mention noise control. <laughs> I, I should have put that in there. So it will also, you know, for example, if you've got a, a subwoofer in, um, and it's, it's just resting on the it could be resting on the floor or resting on on whatever. Maybe it's a loudspeaker, it's a bookshelf speaker, and it's it's on a, a bookshelf. Well, that subwoofer uh, anyway. You're going to hear the subwoofer on the other end of the house unless you isolate it. If you isolate it properly, now it won't get into the structure, and it will not then therefore excite the the structure at the other end of the room. So uh, those in other uh, parts of the building won't be any more distracted. You know, maybe somebody's trying to study or sleep or something, and and um, the subwoofer is annoying. If you mechanically isolate the subwoofer, then it is a noise control benefit to them. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the uh, the scientific approach to. Um, either noise control or sound quality. So I'm going to apply this one to, to noise control. So in step one, we want to evaluate the noise environment under the existing or maybe it's new construction under the expected conditions. And so we're having to, to model in the computer. So in order to do that, we've got to understand the means of each noise path in term. And I, I path meaning plural. It's not, you know, noise isn't just a single path. It's going to be multiple paths in terms of octave band sound levels. So we want to break it up in, in, in frequency because, again, we have to address those different frequencies with different treatments. We, are, we have to measure or model that sound energy, the levels and spectra um, contribution of each path. We have to understand the, um, the sound paths, how they are are working. We've got to measure or model the total noise octave band spectrum at the receiver location. So now we have a, a better understanding of what the noise is, its way to the receiver, and what the noise levels are at the receiver. Next, we have to determine the acceptable noise lever, level or criterion at the receiver location. So what is our goal? What's our target? What are we trying to achieve? Um, obtain the difference between the two noise energies and prioritize each noise path contribution. So one's going to be um, uh, more um, problematic. One's, one noise path is going to be more problematic than another one. We've got to establish the physical, budgetary, decor, local code, resource constraints. Uh, I might also add... Um, possible time constraints. And then after all that, we can then evaluate the various design material solutions to meet the objective goals. So it, it, it's a, that's, the, that's the strategy, that's the approach. And here's just a, a quick idea of, 
you know, all the possibilities. Let's say we've got a the copier or it could be any kind of an appliance. Um, well, we could get a, copy, uh, a quieter appliance. That's one solution. We can block it in an enclosure. We can line it with some absorption. The, um, the airborne um, path, we can add sound absorption to, the, um, to that path. We can put up a, an acoustic barrier. We can isolate it. We can put a, cause a, a structural break. Um, we can mask it with white noise. We can even use earplugs. So there's a lot of solutions. There's, there's, and typically with something like that, there's multiple uh, paths and solutions to, to obtain the goal. So we've talked about this. So yeah. this is a dynamic range. And, and let's say we, you know, approximately, 100 dB is available to us. In some systems, we we might ask or experience a, a little bit more, but let's just go with 100 dB. In our typical 40 dB quiet residence, we're experiencing 60 dB of it. And the area in the blue there is all the area that we cannot hear. So that that's masked, that's covered up by our noise floor. And we would like to get down to um, and, and it, you know, and it is a, it's doable. It can be done. An ambient noise floor that'll gain, give us another 12 dB. So not only are we going to enjoy, to me, for music, dynamics has so much expression, so much personal expression in, you know, from the uh, the music, and and um, so to miss out on a lot of that is is detrimental to the experience, right? not to mention some of the low level details that we can't hear. So um, the, the only other way to get around it is to turn it up um, uh, 100 to 112 dB, <laughs> which we're not gonna do. That could uh, uh, damage our hearing forever. So- um, uh, Norman, uh, Norman, if I can interrupt you here. Uh, yeah. Would I be right in also saying that uh, if you're not addressing the problem uh, properly and if you're just uh, as you said in the last statement if you're just cranking up the volume uh, overall you're also you're also amplifying the bad parts of the overall uh, the audio i uh, have to call it that way is that right yeah oh yeah sure yeah that's true like like for example <clears throat> the room modes that exist are just going to be that more problematic any buzzes or you know resonance, all that are going to be that much more excited too. So yeah, it's not really an answer. I was really um, making a, a, yeah. a joke. <laughs> yeah. Hi Norman, uh, Sandeep yes. here. I have. Yes. I just want to share one of my recent experiences uh, when I was uh, uh, practically measuring the room modes in the room. Uh, okay. One thing which was uh, not really expected, but of course it's it's that was that uh, what I was doing is I was standing in one of the peaks of the room, you know, at, uh, at the fundamental modes. Right. Uh, turn it on the side wall or, you know, the front or back wall. The okay. moment I started to speak, when the mode was excited, there was a considerable amount of intermodular distortion in my voice. Yes. Oh, very yeah. really high. I mean, I, that was, I mean, I, that gave a very clear idea that uh, it's not just the the destination, it's also affecting the source badly, you know? Right. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So this was, that intermodular was, was the competence was definitely not expected. And, and, <laughs> and I, I, it's as bad as your voice is being modulated to an extreme high level. It was like chattering. <laughs> it was chattering. Right. I mean, I was like, if if the the room uh, base part is not treated, and I'm sure that it, it's going to affect the mid in an extremely bad way. I mean, uh, right. that was a very enlightening thing. It was very recent, like about a week ago, we were doing a project in Hyderabad. So we just saw <laughs> that. And I was like, man, this, even I, I, I wouldn't be surprised. Even a four or five dB is also a lot. Or six dB is a lot. I don't say Right. So it's oh, yeah. yeah. It's hard to digest. In fact, yeah. yeah. When when I was talking about you know a twenty five dB swing, that's conservative. I mean, it's typical for people to to even experience a thirty dB difference. Well, my gosh, you know. But here we are. I, I would We're tell you, here. Norman, a shocking thing. I would tell you, uh, in my experience, visiting about one hundred and fifty demo rooms in the country, 
uh, it's sad to see that you don't even find one base trap. Uh, Sandeep, oh, we'll, 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 uh, we'll let Norman continue the presentation. We'll, yeah, yeah, but they're just giving up. Yeah, yeah. Norman, over yeah. back to you. Go ahead. Um, when, you know, something interesting to do, I mean, this is why, for example, we don't want to put the listener or the speakers near the boundaries because they will excite the, the remotes that much more um, and be problematic. But something to do is, uh, and maybe you have, is do a, um, excuse me, a sweep from, say, whatever, 20, 30 hertz on up to about uh, 350 hertz. And um, and note it, just keep yourself in a position and do that slow sweep. And you will hear the, you know, there's three axes of room modes, right? Width, length, and height. You'll hear those modes move around like a, a grid. Um, it's 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 fun to do. All right. So back to um, ambient noise floor. So this is a, a typical test that's done for um, to to understand the, the background noise for, um, for example, HVAC. And uh, um, there's a lot that can be done with HVAC and, and doesn't cost a, a lot. I, I mean, I'm existing construction, you can do a lot and control it and, and keep it down um, so that it is, doesn't become a distraction. Um, and here's in black was a before and, and in blue after. Um, so anyway, it's uh, um, it, it's something that um, a lot of people don't think about, I uh, and and should and uh, and is fairly easy to address. Okay, so here's reverberation times. Now this is interesting in that you know as I said, every reverberation time, every room is is unique and has a different curve. So what this curve represents is fifty rooms. It's the average of 50 rooms. Now, what I do when I when I am uh, uh, doing a reverberation test in a room is typically I will select nine different positions. I'm always going to have, uh, there's uh, going to be one sweet spot though, correct? There's going to be one magic spot where there could only be one spot where all the, um, the loudspeakers can converge in space and time and level. Um, but to, if I'm looking at reverberation times of the room, then I have to get an average of that. And so I need to pick, say, nine different locations that are different from one another um, uh, physically in the room. And, and each one of those is going to have seven measurements. So it'll be average. So this is the average of, of uh, a lot of measurements, 50 different rooms nine different positions each, seven um, reverberation times each nine locations. And it, it's silly, but it, it just gives you an idea of, okay, so on average, this is the kind of reverberation wildness that people are dealing with. And you can see it's it's pretty crazy. <clears throat> We've got, um, of course, what we call in, this, in the United States media rooms where, you know, Okay, it's a family room and it's also um, a home theater room. And so that's probably what's contributing to some of the, the really long reverberation times that we're seeing here. But in any case, we do not want this. This is, this is very tonal um, and very unarticulate. For example, when we talk about speech intelligibility in such a room, if I say the word bat, you well, I, it's right there, so you can see it. Right. Let's say I, it could have been bath, bad, ban. I could have said a number of different words, and the reverberation would have covered up the consonant at the end there, so that you could not understand what word I said. If we have the reverberation times under control, then the consonant, the T in bat is audible. It can be it can be heard and understood. So speech intelligibility is very important, especially when you're, you know, in a, in a home theater. Okay, so this is, um, this is a room on the top with reverberation times, and there you go, nine positions, each seven measured seven times and averaged. And you can see that very different curve, correct, from the one that we just looked at, which was an average. But in any case, this is a typical room, carpeted room. 
And then down below, this is the same room, same system, but engineered correctly for, um, for acoustics. So the acoustic panel systems, ours in particular, because it, it's, um, uh, it goes down lower than, than typical. Um, it's very linear. And note also, not only is it controlled, but from seat to seat, so the same locations, they vary a whole lot less. So in other words, even if you're not in the magic seat, you're, um, you're closer to the target than, if, uh, than in an untreated room. Now notice there's a little bit longer reverberation time in the low frequencies, and that is desired. And this is the reason why. And this is a, a psychoacoustic reason only. And uh, I'll, I'll give you a little backstory um, on that. So at, um, I'm often in a fully anechoic chamber and uh, at the Owens Corning Lab, which is about 10, 10 minutes from me, from where I am right now, they have a, a pretty large one and, um, and it's fully anechoic. So um, in other words, uh, there's a, a steel um, netting that you walk on and there's, uh, there's big wedges below. Well, um, again, when I have VIPs come in, you have to talk about research and development. You bring them into the, the anechoic room. And there have been a couple of experiences where the individual, upon entering the anechoic chamber, feels sick, feels nauseous, and, and has to get out. And um, the reason being is that it's our experience that, you know, well, I'm looking at this room, it should sound this way. So what our eyes see and what our ears perceive confuse the brain and we feel nauseous, we feel sick. Um, and so <clears throat> we now note that we do not experience that when we wear headphones and there's no reflections, or if we go outside into a, a field, uh, a tall a tall grass or, or maybe fresh um, powder snow, and there's no reflections. We don't feel nauseous at all. Again, it's our experience. It's what we understand. It's what we've, we've learned. Um, I have spent a lot of time in anechoic chambers, and I'm fine. I don't have that, that issue. But it is common for people to, um, to feel uncomfortable in a room that's, um, that does not have the low frequency return that we expect. Well, that's nice in that low frequency energy, they're long wavelengths, there's a lot of energy, they're very difficult to control. So it kind of works in our favor that to have a little bit longer decay, stay at 125 hertz and down and a slight ascent. And there's a, there's a formula that I kind of uh, like to look at for that, depending on the size of the room. Um, that's to our advantage in that it's easier to address. Um, and it, it, it makes for a comfortable environment psychoacoustically. So often what people do, again, here's a different room, totally different room. And in yellow, you see it's got really poor wild reverberation times. <clears throat> so in this room, this was just a, a, a challenge for, you know, for research for me is um, um, if you've got people typically will use one or two inch fiberglass panels in the room and they'll use too many of them. And so note in red, the fiberglass panels, and I don't care if it's one inch or, or, or two inch, they're gonna perform pretty much the same in that you can see they are only effective down to 500 Hertz. So in other words, about the top half of a piano keyboard, they are addressing, and the lower half of the piano keyboard, they are not addressing, they aren't touching at all. And so um, even optimally doing my best, I still ended up having too much absorption in the high frequency range above what I wanted. I've got this window where I wanna see from 125 Hertz on up a linear reverberation time as I did achieve in the green there. So that window is between 0.25 seconds and 0.4 seconds. And then at 125 and down, a little longer tail, maybe to about 0.7 um, or so. So just note again that, um, you, that the right treatment at the right location and the right quality, quantity is uh, important to, to discover 
Otherwise, you know, if you're just guessing, you're going to miss the target. Um, this one we already talked about, articulation. This is isolation. This is mechanical isolation. This is showing uh, uh, one of our products. Um, so on the upper left hand, that's no isolation. This is, again, all of our products are lab tested in an accredited lab, um, and we post our uh, the reports on online. Um, on the uh, so this is done with an impulse hammer test. So the only thing in the equation is the isolator, the device under test. There's an accelerometer below it. An impulse hammer is used to excite it. <clears throat> if um, if on the right hand side is our equipment vibration protector, its natural resonant frequency response is 3.4 hertz, and it, you can see it's affected from 5 hertz on up. If I use something that is not uh, an isolator, which we typically see in our industry. We see spikes, um, rigid, hard feet. They are couplers. They are not decouplers. And, and down below, that's a, a spiked uh, aluminum cone. You can see that it actually resonates at many audible frequencies. So it attenuates some frequencies, and it amplifies many others. It sounds different. It doesn't sound right. It's not consistent and repeatable. For example, if I um, change the shape or the material or the size or change the load, that graph there will change. So uh, proper isolation is again engineered and, and needs to be um, addressed correctly or else you're gonna run into, again, problems where it, it doesn't sound right, it's not consistent and it's not repeatable. <clears throat> so with mechanical isolation, this is interesting. A lot of people haven't really um, uh, thought it, uh, in this kind of detail, I'd say. So there's several um, vibrations that we receive. Let's say we've got, we're in our room, we've got a floor standing speaker um, sitting on the floor and we are, are listening to music. <laughs> The first arrival is structure born. So the, the, the denser the material, the faster and farther vibrations will transfer in it. So the first arrival is structure born to our butt and then bone conduction to our, our ears. Um, the second arrival is the only wanted vibration we want. That's in the airborne from the, the loudspeaker to our ears. That one we want. The third is airborne, but it's reflections off of the floor and the walls and, and the ceilings. The fourth is structurally transmitted from the structure in the form of resonances. So the energy, there's cavities. <clears throat> Every material re um, resonates. When we play a frequency that sympathizes with those resonances, then they actually store it for, a, a, kind of work like a capacitor. They'll store it for a moment and then release it back into the, um, the listening space later in time. So note here, we've got a pre and post um, vibrations, structural vibrations that we don't want that interfere and smear uh, in time and um, and make it droning when those play back. Uh, let's say, for example, like in, in the U.S., in typical two by four construction, um, you put a little light fist bump between studs, and you're going to hear seventy hertz. Well, when I play music that has seventy hertz in it, which is pretty much any music, um, they'll take that um, energy and and in sympathy they'll release it back later in time. It, so the, the speaker, the, the room is now um, performing just like a loudspeaker all around me, but it's doing it later in time and it's adding to the original. So it's playing when the original, the speaker, that event has stopped. So again, in articulation, it becomes a problem, not to mention buzzes and, and rattles. So um, yeah, isolation is, is something that a lot of people don't think, most people don't think about, and is really important to um, the sound quality attributes, not to mention the noise control. So no, here's an uh, idea. I'll, I'll, uh, here again. I just, one, one small point I want to add here. 
So uh, more often than not, I I encounter that isolation is a, a ends up being a post mortem kind of a job, wherein uh, people don't uh, think about isolation in the design stage itself, and they always encounter that uh, they, it it comes as a com complaint from a neighbor or a complaint from let's say <laughs> their own their own uh, let's say their neighboring room within the same uh, within, the, within the same house, for example. So yeah. I think isolation is something that we all need. To give a long importance to. Uh, yes. Norman, one one last uh, thing which I want to ask you, like uh, uh, we are uh, exactly one hour uh, down the, the presentation so since the start. I know uh, I'm so sorry to interrupt you here, but uh, I just want to ask you, like, uh, do you think that uh, we should uh, uh, maybe uh, ask the audience for some questions at this point of time, or do you want to uh, let's say uh, continue? I leave it up to you. I am absolutely open because I. I wanted to have a possibly of a hard stop at around uh, uh, seventy-five to eighty minutes, if it's okay with the audience, because the the topic is so vast that we can go on and go on. But uh, at the end of the day, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So I leave yes, it to you. I... Leave it to you completely. So yeah, over back to you. That's that's totally fine. In fact, maybe you know, in the second segment, we could pick up, um, and that might be interesting to to do. Um, so yeah, let me just finish with this slide then. So here is the typical, you know, subwoofers on the floor. The whole house is excited. It, over on the right, if you isolate it properly, then it is not. And you just have the, the airborne. That's what we want. And to, to take your, you know, to give you a, a real world example. Yes, I would say that um, uh, I get, I mean, constantly the complaint is, when, is after, let's say they built a new home and they did not consider structural vibrations and, and isolating of the structure or even you know, isolating the, um, the speakers themselves, then they discover that they cannot use their home theater after their kids have gone to bed. <laughs> it's such a, you know, a, a, a terrible thing to realize. Um, and to address it now is, is really difficult to do. Um, to isolate the floor, the walls, the ceiling, the plumbing, the HVAC, all those things should be addressed at the design stage. And, um, and when they're not, then, you know, then you end up with a, a, an unhappy customer. Um, so yes, I deal with that uh, frequently. So yeah, I can unshare now. Uh... So I leave it to you, Norman. So, uh, okay. Uh, I think, uh, shall we open the, the floor to, for questions from the audience? Okay. So yeah, okay. uh, let's do that. Yeah, okay. uh, sure. There are no questions in the chat box, which I found, which is uh, there were general comments. So uh, may I request, uh, let's say any uh, questions from the audience. So. Uh, I would request that please raise your hand. There's an option of raising your hand uh, on the uh, Zoom window. Uh, so I, I just repeat for the sake of uh, uh, the clarity, Norman is going to be coming back uh, again because uh, the, the, the topic of discussion being so vast, uh, he is not going to be in a position to finish it today. So we are going to be uh, inviting Norman again for a session in the future. So, uh, uh, so we can have some audience questions. So please raise your hand on the uh, on the window, the Zoom window, and uh, you can unmute yourself and you can ask your question to Norman. Over to the audience. Uh, can you hear me? This is Milan Kuntur. Yep. Yes, I can. So yeah, very very interesting and wonderful talk. Uh, I basically, I also agree with everything you said. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, what, what, one question is uh, something uh, that I've not completely under, understood is uh, this trend to uh, isolate the speakers from the floor. In, in, in the past or distant past, the idea was to anchor it to the floor to prevent uh, the recoil. And that, that yeah. makes a difference. If you put the speaker directly on the carpet, including a subwoofer versus having spikes, the, the base seems to be tighter and otherwise it be just becomes very dull and loose. How do you, uh, it seems like you have conflicting uh, goals, right? Well, one is to not let the vibration go into the floor, but then you kind of need to hold it in place. To, to, yeah, okay. Uh, so so the answer is um, pretty lengthy, but um, so 
spikes in the noise and vibration industry and even in the pro audio industry, spikes don't exist. Um, it is not something that coupling is not something that we want. We want to decouple. Understand that if I use a spike or I use an isolator, a, a coupler or a decoupler, that the speaker cabinet is still free to move. It won't change that at all. However, if I use a coupler, something rigid like a spike or, or something, vibrations will transfer into the structure. It's always a two-way street. It'll also return and go back into the cabinet. If I isolate, if I decouple, that will not happen. And I will also not now excite the structure. So it will be quiet, which is something that most people have never experienced. And as I've mentioned here, is dramatic. It's, um, it, it hits all sound quality attributes and noise control. So yes, it, it's, it's just in the audiophile world that we see these spikes. And I understand that, uh, you know, it, um, it sounds different. Understand it's never repeatable. If I use a spike on this floor, it will perform differently than if I use it on this floor or if I put a different speaker on it. Everything will change. All the variables will change. So in other words, no consistency, no predictability. Um, we don't want that. We want neutrality. We want repeatability. We want consistency. So when you isolate properly, that graph that you saw will be, you'll get that every single time. With the other, if I change the shape, it'll change the sound. If I change the material density or its size or what it's resting on or anything, I will alter the sound. Right. Uh, yeah, so yeah, I, I, I want to isolate. Yeah. Now I, I understand uh, it'll improve the neutrality and, uh, and not inject vibration into the floor in the room, but uh, uh, you're, you're able to control the recoil. Yes, when you decouple, you are also, because vibration's a two-way street, anything right. that gets into that core, whether it's coming from the top or, or the bottom, is going to be converted to thermal energy instead of mechanical energy. With something rigid, it goes both ways. It's a conduit. So yeah, so, reflections can go back into the cabinet. Right. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, Norman, uh, I'll just add to the, this point that you mentioned uh, based on my experience uh, back in the day. So uh, we like to look at everything as a filter. So uh, I would say that uh, probably something like what you, I, I believe your EVP is having a resonant frequency of approximately what you said, 3.5 hertz? 3.4. When you load it properly. Mm -hmm. Yes. So uh, when you have a resonant frequency of 3.4 hertz, essentially that structure is acting as a low pass filter. So it's, am I right uh, in that statement, uh, Norman? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes. And so with, uh, with isolators, you always want to find what's the under load, under the proper, whatever weight you're going to be putting it on. We have mm -hmm. different densities and sizes for different weights. Um, you want to look at what is the natural resonant frequency under load. And you want yep. it to be ideally an octave below the lowest yep. frequency of interest. So yes. for example, I want to have it, I want to have it effective below 20 hertz, right? Um, and if you've got anything uh, that is in the audible bandwidth, then it's going to color the sound. So one of the good, uh, one of the uh, interesting things that we have in uh, the construction that we have in India is that most of the walls are brick walls. So fundamentally, they 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 enable a, a better kind of a, a situation. So inherently, they are like uh, they have better resonant uh, properties in that sense. Better resonant properties, but something to also consider is the fact that they are better containers for low frequency energy. Of course, and so um, that's true. that's. True. Ideally, you want to build something in front of that that allows flex so you have some diaphragmatic absorption to help with the room that's modes. That's right. Yeah. Okay. No, no, it's much no, easier no. to do that than, say, um, building a, um, not that you can also do that, but building a base trap in, inside the room 
Oh my gosh, that takes a lot of real estate and it's not very effective. Yes, yes. Yeah. No, no, and just a follow-up thing. So uh, between the three possibilities, let's say you have a, a, a carpeted uh, a floor, you know, typical uh, American house, so the wooden subfloor with, car with carpeting on it. So placing the speaker directly on that with nothing, placing it with, you know, spikes or cones, and uh, having this uh, isolator. So, you know, you, you would say the isolator is the best, but between putting it directly on the carpet versus spiking, what, what, what's your experience? Well, like I say, if, um, if we isolate it, then um, uh, no reflections and nothing is going to get into the, the structure. Um, if with a properly if designed I, isolator. With, 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 with a, a with properly a proper, designed... Right. But I, I, I'm saying... Uh, uh, if you had to put a speaker, you know, just directly on a wooden floor or a carpeted floor versus spiking, uh -huh. what's the experience between oh, those two? Oh, oh, okay, I see. I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. No, I, oh, I, 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 I agree with the properly designed isolator. Yes, that's the best. But between the other two, what's your right? Okay, so um, let me give you this. Uh, at at the trade shows, you're going to have to imagine this with me. Okay. I have, I wish I had it right here, darn it. I have a little tiny music box mechanism, okay? No box, just the music box mechanism. The tines, they go down to 500 hertz, believe it or not. Um, and if I play them in air, you, you can't hear it. it. The tines are moving 0 0.1 millimeter, plus or minus 0 0.1 millimeter, okay? Yeah. Not much energy. Let's say it's about the energy of a tweeter, although it's going down to about 500 hertz. Sure. If I put that on the on the my desk here and play it, now the whole tabletop is oh. vibrating oh, sure. and it is yeah. 27 okay. dB louder. Okay. Oh, sure. um, if I so it that tiny amount of energy is causing the whole tabletop to amplify at about 30 dB and um, and the whole tabletop is only moving a few billionths of oh, yeah. a meter. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I, I, so, I've done this demo. Yeah. Yeah. so yeah, spikes are not going to stop the, the um, cabinet from, from vibrating, nor will no, it stop I'm... reflections from the floor caused by external or from the loudspeaker itself from reflecting back into the cabinet. Uh, I'll just add to what Norman said. So, so structure bond noise can only be measured using an accelerometer. So you require extremely uh, uh, and uh, extremely sensitive and uh, very probably having a very uh, large dynamic range and also in terms of sensitivity. So yeah, mm -hmm. okay. on. the music box ne mechanisms in neat in that that's nothing compared to you know the woofer energy and yet oh my gosh anybody can can um, can relate to it and then understand uh, why coupling is not desirable. Any other questions that uh, the that we have in the audience? Uh, please raise your hand on the uh, on the Zoom window before you post your questions, and you can uh, unmute yourself to ask the question. Anyone else? Well, good. I did a good job. Everybody understands. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, Norman, uh, do you want to make any concluding uh, comments before we sign off for today, or uh, are we okay? I leave it to you. So, uh... Um, <clears throat> uh, it's just that uh, um, I think it's important for people to, especially under new construction, to to think about um, noise control. And um, uh, and the internal, you know, um, sound quality attributes before they they begin, so that the the customer isn't surprised at, and or disappointed at the end. Um, there are so many topics that we can get into. You know, calibration is is so important, and again, I think calibration is you know takes precedent again over sound quality. <laughs> Not sound quality over equipment. If we've got um, 
really high-end equipment and it's not calibrated properly, then again, it, it's not going to meet its potential. So um, the the misunderstanding that, you know, uh, get new equipment and it'll it'll fix your problems. No, it's just going to alter them. And it's not, it's not going to fix the, the heart of the problem. And uh, if we can address the heart of the problem, we can have a much better, enjoyable, better experience, regardless of the quality of the equipment. Uh, so if I can just maybe ask you one, uh, one last question. It's a, it's a question at, at the same time, it's also an observation. Would there be a kind of a recipe that you would uh, maybe outline for us in terms of, let's say, uh, what would be the sequence or the chronological order of uh, uh, doing a particular, uh, let's say, a, a room design or what are the most important factors? If you have to attribute some percentages, uh, numbers to that? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> yes, definitely. So there's this foundation, um, both uh, acoustically and, and electrically. Uh, so we want to look at um, at offering a neutral, quiet, uh, controlled environment acoustically. We also mm -hmm. want to and um, to offer a um, an AC source that is capable not only of being uh, undistorted and quiet, um, isolated again, <laughs> electrically isolated, um, and able of uh, high current capability. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about this in, in the, the next segment. So that's the foundation is, is we wanna be looking at um, understanding the electrical and, and the acoustical. Um, then we are looking at um, the physical location, optimizing the listeners and the speakers within that environment, which is gonna be dictated by the, the dimensions and or the construction materials and methods. Then we're going to be looking at uh, uh, calibration of all the um, the equipment. Then we can look at um, uh, acoustic treatment to control the, the reverberation times. The first order reflection points actually is what I look at first. Then after I've got those under control, then I look at the, um, the reverberation times. Um, uh, then we can start looking at uh, um, the the quality of, of the equipment. Uh, again, you know, it can be anything. We have to have those things in place. Then whatever the equipment is, it's going to perform to its, its utmost. And then lastly, up on the top, then we would be talking about tweaks. You know, what can we do to, now that we've got everything under control, what's, what might we do to make things better? So, yeah. That's kind of what I call the, um, Priority, the audio, I forget what I call it, the priority pyramid. And I've, I've got a graphic somewhere uh, about that. And it just shows that pyramid and the foundation and the order that we need to go. It, it, it's important to understand that in um, we we have to make course adjustments before we can make fine ones. I think hey. people can, can relate that. And uh, I think there are also are attributes of, uh, let's say, there are also uh, points of uh, like diminishing returns for various aspects of the entire. Um, yeah. Oh, the absolutely. Yeah. 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 So and that's really kind one, of the. For that in the next session, probably. Like, where yeah. do we put off? Like, beyond a particular point, there is no point in trying to um, uh, more uh, put more isolation or there's no point in trying to do more room treatment or whatever that that is. So we could yeah. uh, maybe talk that uh, in, the, in the upcoming session. Yeah, well, really, that's the, the the whole point of this presentation is the fact that, you know, there is a, a hierarchy, there's a, a, a priority. You've got to deal with the big thing, the big obstacles before you can address the little ones. And I think in, in our industry, that is not well understood. And uh, people are making not adjustments that don't matter because yes. this is in the yes. way. Yes. Yeah. And uh, you, you you put it brilliantly. The fact that there are a lot of a uh, lot of compensations which can be even done free of cost or very very marginal uh, uh, price points, as opposed to uh, using some fancy tools which can be extremely expensive too, and uh, not really causing that much improvements. So Correct. yeah, it's it's a, it's a it's a very important thing for us to be aware of what are the spectrum of opportunities to uh, improve the sound quality. 
Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and that's what it's all about is a better experience. Yeah. Well, equipment, the quality of the equipment is is not the biggest obstacle. The room is going to have the, the loudest and the, the final say. Yes. Uh, okay. I think uh, we are uh, 95 minutes into the session. So. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, we should Sandeep, not I have, I have should, something to share. Uh, okay, Sandeep, this is the last yeah, question. Yeah, yeah, yeah quick. It's, it's a very simple thing uh, because uh, Norman was talking about the vibration isolation. Uh, like, you know, uh, what uh, I have developed in uh, the recent times that, uh, you know, vibration isolation for different frequencies to be designed differently, for different bands, you know, it has a tremendous effect. One vibration isolator would not solve you know, the whole spectrum, you know, the efficiency, just like the way how we have a full range driver and a multi this one. Uh, I mean, on the electronics front, you know, even I have seen a difference, but yeah, the decoupling part, what he said, I really take it because I've practically seen that in many things. And Sandeep, uh, the, the simple point is that the decoupler is basically a low pass filter. So it straight away sh sh cuts off all your frequencies above yeah, that yeah. Uh, certain frequency. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, there's no true. question about any uh, spikes or anything coming as long yeah, as... Yeah, true, uh, true. That's why we know, no, spike is an absolute no-no. I mean, I, I, I still see a lot of companies do marketing for it. But... Yeah, so this is a point which I think people should un understand. See, because at the end of the day, we talk about everything in terms of a filter. So if you understand things from the, from the point of view of a filter, you, I think it's it. exactly. yeah. To I mean to address your question, you can definitely build isolators to address particular bandwidths. But so we have uh, done it. We have done that. Yeah, yeah. But for example, the um, our product, the equipment vibration protector, you can see the 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 results. Um, it starts right at five hertz, and and um, conservatively it will mitigate 90% of the energy from five hertz on up. So, you know, nothing in the, um, in the audible bandwidth. Okay, uh, I think uh, we are running short of time. Uh, of course, we are always open to Norman, Norman uh, spending more time with us, but uh, I think we'll uh, defer the, the remaining topics for the next session. And uh, so, with that said, uh, thank you, Norman, for your time. That's a fantastic thank you. session. I hope you liked uh, the questions also from the audience. And uh, yeah. I look forward yeah. to having you uh, in the upcoming session uh, very soon. Okay. Sounds uh, good. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Appreciate thank it. You. Uh, have a great time at Expona. Oh, yes, I will. All right. <laughs> and uh, Munich, night. too. Hope to see yeah. some of you there. Stop I'll, by and say hello. I'll, I'll, I'll see you at Munich, uh, Norman. Great, great, cool. All right, thanks. Okay, Norman, have a good day. Have a good night, folks. Thank you so much, everyone. All right. Bye.